nation with authority and submission from today's passage, 1 Corinthians 11, one of the more challenging passages of the Bible and uh, different ideas on that. But uh, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 11 there in your Bible. We've been studying through Paul's letter and noticed in the first six chapters of God's Word that uh, the Corinthian church had matters that required correction and instruction. We can be very thankful that God providentially permitted so many problems to come up here in this early church that uh, uh, is instructional and helpful for us. We found in 7.1 that Paul answered, that it pointed out he was answering their questions that they wrote to him about, and he was dealing with them. And questions on marriage, questions on the home and singleness, questions in regard to meat offered to idols and weaker brother and stronger brother issues, and we've talked about that the last few weeks. Chapter 11 addresses another problem in the Corinthian church, and in order to properly understand this portion, we need to visualize a condition that had existed in these early days of the church. Corinth was uh, very immoral, and it was probably the worst character of any city that Paul ministered in. And uh, when we are in the same condition here in our country today with immorality, immodesty, and chastity being mocked, and uh, having a worldly society with rampant and open sin, more and more availability of those things. And uh, so uh, there's, there's ways in our lives that we need to be aware of how we're being attacked and how the bar is being lowered around us, and we need to decide what is right and wrong and hold up a standard of what is right. Here in Corinth, uh, sailors had a saying uh, about avoiding going to Corinth because of the rampant immorality that they would had this saying about sailors not going there because many times the sailors would get involved in that. And so sailors kind of had uh, this that they would discuss. Sexual sin and the upset of God's plan for the family was violated terribly in that day as it is in ours. God has a plan for the family. It is the foundation of society that we would be a people that will be together uh, with a, a man, a husband, a father, a wife, a mother, and the children. That that is the core of society that God designed right back from Genesis and throughout the Bible that we would have that core and that we would guard that core and that we would uphold that standard even though all around us we're struggling uh, with, with relationships and things are not what we would like for today maybe in my relationships and yours with our family. Right, I'd like to have my wife here. But God has a plan and we go with it, right? But a, a, a husband and a wife married one time uh, husband and wife as, as uh, designed by God at, at uh, uh, fertilization, right? Um, when we came into being, a husband and wife that are married, uh, one time made those vows before men and God and are married for life until death do us part. And then having children in that. And then raising children to, to be people of character, to know right and wrong, and to chasten them when the things are done wrong, to hold a standard as this is what God expects. I'm under God raising you, and I want you to follow God. And so all of those things get out of kilter when there is uh, all kinds of sexual deviancy. All right? And um, where shall we begin to list them, right? LGBTQ and all that kind of, right? And, and all of that, lust and, and immorality. So we battle against that. Can I hear a, yes, pastor, we're with you on it. Yes, pastor, we're with you. Or, or, or the word amen means the same thing, right? Okay. So as we think about this, um, sexual sin um, is, was a problem here in Corinth, and Paul was desirous that Christian women should not permit anything in their behavior that would allow the least shadow of doubt upon their testimony of purity. Immoral women in that day went uh, with butched hair or shaved heads and were found in the temple and in the streets unblushingly, unblushingly seeking to seduce men into their sin and immorality, wickedness. Women who sought to live in purity were careful never in public to go unveiled. The unveiled woman was the careless, immoral woman. 
The veiled woman was the careful wife or mother who was concerned about her character and her reputation. It would seem that when Christianity came to Corinth and converted women rejoiced in the liberty that Paul preached and presented that were free from the Jewish, Jewish Mosaic law and some of the, 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 the chains that were bound of sacrifices and offering and all of those things, that uh, it seemed that that liberty was carried too far. You know, when the pendulum is on one side and it swings to the other, often it will swing too far. And uh, so... Um, some of those women became careless and indifferent as to the customs, not just of Judaism, but the customs of the society of their day, and would perhaps say, we're all one in Christ. Paul taught in Christ there is neither male nor female, so there is no reason uh, now why Christian women should be subject to any of the restrictions of this day. We don't need to wear a head covering in public places. Well, that's what Paul is going to be addressing today. So let's pray as we uh, move forward here in 1 Corinthians 11. And um, we'll, we'll tr uh, just pray for me that I can speak every word 100% accurately. This is probably one of the uh, toughest, one, of the, one tough passage in the Bible to delve into. I've done a lot of thought, prayer, and study. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your word, you are the master you are the Lord. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Word is the authority. Help us to understand your Word and guide my words and our understanding of it and direct us each in our conscience before you as this is uh, another one of those passages where it speaks of um, the idea in the context of not offending our brother or our sister. So guide us in this, in this time. Help us to rejoice in our liberty, but also to know what is still expected of us. May you get the glory, Lord. And we, may we live faithful and understand faithful until we go home to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, as we think about um, our, our scripture today, we need to guard foundational, foundational principles. Guard, I, I've started it off, what is he talking about here? Because in verse 1 of chapter 11, 1, um, it says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And uh, that's, our, that's our second point. Um, if we back up to 1031, coming off of the last chapter, it says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, giving no offense in verses 32 and 33. We need to be a, a testimony for Christ. So it's coming out of this larger context of not a, the... the, the a stronger brother offending the weaker brother, or the stronger brother not going into idol temples and living ungodly and adopting those things that we push back from that, and we need to have a central walk. Are you living to the glory of God? Did you live last week in whatever you do, whether you do it, uh, are you eating or drinking to the glory of God? Are you interested in pleasing God? Are you living as a follower of Christ? Paul says, imitate me. But how? Just as I also imitate Christ. Are you an example that we could all say, let's pick this person over here today to be our example. Let's all be like so-and-so. Or let's all be like so-and-so over here. Could we set you up as an example? Caitlin, can I call you up this morning? Can I, can I call up? Who, who can I pick over here? Mary? Uh, Bev? Can I call one of you ladies up here to be an example, right? Can, can we do that? That's what Paul's saying. Follow me. I want to ask you, if you get nothing else, right, get this from the beginning. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. We are to be an example. Uh, we notice also we're to live as followers of Christ in that sense, imitating him, and then live as you have been faithful. So he's a, he has a verse of encouragement here. Notice what he says in verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. He's praising them. That you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I that delivered them to you. And the word tradition here could speak of ordinance, um, the general Christian instruction that he had been giving. Not the, the mosaic tradition that the Jews had been living, but the teachings that he has been giving. He says, you folks are doing well, and I, I, I praise you. Better circle that word praise, you don't have to circle it. But uh, because he's going to move from there now, 
He's being very positive. He says, you're doing well. You need to imitate me. You need to live to the glory of God. And these are kind of introductory to what he's going to dive into as we move forward. Notice, secondly, that we need to guard uh, God-established roles. We as Christians need to guard God-established roles. Notice that Christ is the head of every man here in verse 3. But I want you to know, just as he's just praised them, talked to them about imitating and glorifying God and being a testimony to the lost, he says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is who? Christ. The head of every man is Christ. Men, we are responsible before God to follow his leadership. And so when we're in church, we don't wear hats is the idea is that uh, it's, it's kind of a custom um, that, uh, you know, if I was up here wearing a hat and bringing the message today, you might be going, Pastor, isn't that disrespectful? And so, so uh, the, the custom of that day was, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, Christ is the head of every man. Let's take it as I have it on the PowerPoint here. Let's read the whole verse. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay? So the head of the wo- man is the head of, wo- of the woman. That's the way God designed it, and God established it that way, that uh, this, this is something that uh, husbands and wives or daughters, to be all men and women to the extent that the family and society, uh, you know, men, uh, we're, we're responsible for our daughters in a sense that even after they leave home, that, that uh, they can look to us. They should be able to look to us. We should be leading them. We should be praying for them until they are, are married off. There's a sense in which we are still to be caring for those uh, single daughters. Now, if they get married and we need to talk to the guy, if they come, um, and I encourage you men to say, to discuss with your daughter, but also have a plan that if somebody wants to date your daughter, you, you have arranged with your daughter that the daughter needs to ask dad first. And when you do that, have a talk with them and see what they're about. Ask them, uh, say, defer that. Hey, if you want to date me, uh, I want you to ask my dad and be prepared. It's not like you're being engaged, so the discussion's a little bit different. But open that relationship up. And uh, young ladies, I'd encourage you to, to do that. Um, set it up that, that say, hey, go talk to my dad or go talk to my mom uh, before you date me and have that set up that... Uh, there can be that, that help in guidance. And look to your parents. They've been down the road a little further than you. They have some experience. And uh, trust their, their guidance. Take it slow. And um, so uh, the, the head of man is the woman. This comes back. We could trace that back uh, to God's plan. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be considering that in Genesis as we go ahead. But let's move along. And God is the, the head of Christ. Now, why does he say it in this order? as we think about this, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, because he's talking about men and women, but then he talks about women. Secondly, the head of the woman is man, but then he, then he reemphasizes it because uh, often today with uh, feminism and the, the idea of women's liberation and, and uh, you know, the pushing forward of, of women in a sense that, uh, we, you know, we're, we're just as good as everybody else. We can do these things. And it's not a matter of value, it's not a matter that men are, are better than women. It's a, it's a matter of leadership. Who is going to lead? I always think of the phrase, I heard it one time, a two-headed animal is a freak, right? And if it's got two heads, you're going to be in trouble, like an animal, right? Because sometimes animals are born with two heads. What do you do with that, right? Um, and so if, somebody's, if you have two, somebody needs to lead. And God has designed in the Garden of Eden... And part of that is because of the fall that the woman was led aside in the transgression, the Bible mentions, that that men have been positioned as the leader right from creation. And so, but but he brings that back around because it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, Man's the head of woman? Um, Well, yeah, he's crouched that right in the middle. He says, hey, don't, don't worry about that, ladies, women. Don't worry about that because notice the example is that uh, man is under Christ, but Christ is under God. Now, is Christ any less equal to God? Be careful. No. No, he is God. God the Son, God the the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
In essence, they're all the same. But in function, they function differently. Jesus said, I've come to do your will, O God. Jesus came at the direction of God. God the Father seems to have ha has the plan. Uh, God the Son is carrying it out through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so is Jesus any, any less important than the Father? Or is the Holy Spirit less than, than the Son? No, not at all. They're all equal in essence. And so men and women were equal in essence and importance before God. Yes, uh, we are all one in Christ. We rejoice at that. But as far as leadership... Men are to have the lead. And in the Godhead even, as our example, men are to have the lead on that. And in each example, it's true. Authority and submission is based on love, not abuse. Okay, guys? If you think you're going to be the leader, it's not that you can, ah, rrr, ah, rrr. you know what I mean? And uh, that, this, jump when I tell you. No, that's not the idea. And if you have that mentality, you're not following Christ's example. I even as verse 1 says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. What did Christ do for his bride? Died on the cross. And he's loving us and serving us and gracious and merciful with you as his child. Men, we're to be like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians chapter 5. That's our responsibility, not to abuse, but to love. Love, uh, not, not under compulsion, uh, not demanding service, but we are to be there with self-sacrifice, serving God. Christ came submissive to God for our salvation. What did it cost him? By death. Mankind is submissive to Christ for receiving our salvation. We all submit the same. We're all one in Christ. And women are submissive to man in the divine order for salvation of their children and family core in society. Uh, the idea there is uh, that we are to function, men taking the leadership and the example uh, before God and praying for and leading their family in spiritual and material things, providing for their family and caring for their, their bride. And in the wife, uh, Titus chapter 2, it speaks of women. You want to turn over there? Titus chapter 2. First and Second Timothy. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Titus 2, verse 3. Do you find it there? The older women, Titus chapter 2, verse 3. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior and not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they, that's the older women, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children. Okay, so older women, if there's younger women, uh, younger than you here today, you're considered the older woman, right? And, uh, so, and uh, you younger, if you have older women here today, you're to look up to them to follow their, their instruction. So there's a lot of teaching that can go on here. We're to love and care for each other in that sense, okay? Uh, to do, uh, verse 5, Titus 2.5, to be discreet. Women are to be discreet, chaste. In other words, there's that purity. They're to be homemakers, okay? To be ministering at home. Now, that's not promoted much today in our society, is it? Good, obedient to their own husbands. There it is again, to be obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. There's the testimony that's mentioned back here in our passage. And, and you know, wives would be homemakers. Now, these days it's really hard. And there's other reasons for women working outside the home and so forth. So it's not like a hard and fast rule. But the general principle is that a, a man and a woman are to get married and establish a home. And God has blessed the, 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 the woman to carry that child and deliver that child and to then give the, the home care for that child. And so to be keepers at home is a prized and a valued thing that is often mocked overlooked or even rejected today. And so we're to guard our Christian testimony. Notice also, not only are we to guard the foundational principles, we're to guard God-established roles of authority and submission, but we are also to guard our Christian testimony. Verse 4, it says, Every man, praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. And... As we think about a man that does this, dishonors his head, it dishonors him personally. Uh, men were not to cover their head. 
uh, pagan worship practice was that when they would go to worship, men would take their toga in, in the Roman Empire and they would cover their head as a sign of uh, reverence before the God. And he's like, no, don't act like the pagans. Don't act like the pagans there in Corinth. Men were not to cover their head. About the fourth century, I read that that's when Jewish men started to wear the, you know, the, 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 the skull cap there, the, uh, the head covering in, in praying as Jews, but it wasn't even practiced in that day. And uh, so men were not to cover their head there in verse 4. Uh, women, as we go to our next point, uh, well, it not only dishonors them, but it also honors, uh, dishonors our head Christ. Because men, we might like to be like this with God today. God, you don't see me. God, I can forget you. No! We are open to God. God is looking at you men, and we need to have an open relationship with him. We are responsible for ourselves. We are responsible for our spouse. We are responsible to confront our spouse or to love her and lead her and guide her. And the wife is responsible to respond to our loving direction and counsel and showing of the Bible and encouraging them to live certain ways. Men, we are responsible before God to do this. There's, there's no barrier between. Okay? The wife is responsible to respond to her husband's encouragement, example, calling, counsel. It's not up to the man to trounce her, whip her, drive her, right? Okay? The man will give account for himself before the Lord. Man will give account. And we dishonor Christ if we have our head covered. It could be one or other or both of these interpretations of that verse. Okay? It's probably both. We dishonor our head, right? We dishonor Christ by, by doing that, okay? And, uh, you know, the wife is also going to give account of herself, and the children will give account of themselves individually. So the women were to have their, they were to have their head covered in public. Verse 5, it says this, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved, okay? And so as we think about um, women here dishonoring their head, uh, they dishonor their personal head. If, if, they, don't, if they don't have, uh, in that day, in their culture, if they would, wouldn't go out as the, you know, like the Mary and Joseph in the Christmas program or the Easter program, they, you know, we have the, like the Mary, right, the shepherds, right, um, the, the head covering, that kind of an idea. If, if they went out in public like that, that was dishonoring to themselves, and it was also dishonoring to their head, the man, and of course we could say it would be dishonoring to God um, because they were identifying with pagan practices of that day, in particular, where they were going out, and uh, the women were not only there at the temple for the sailors to come in or people of town or travelers through for sexual immorality as part of their worship, but in their society, they would, they would go out with not only their head not covered, but also their hair cut back and even their head shaved because they're like, woohoo, guys, uh, bring your money and we'll have some immorality, fun, and it'll be okay. We'll even make that part of our worship of God. Isn't it a beautiful thing? No, it isn't. They're taking their God-given desires and, and um, uh, body parts to be used in a way that's dishonoring to God. God designed our bodies our desires, our functions, and when they were connecting it with paganism and when they, women that were Christians were going out without the head covering, they were, they were going out and saying, I'm as much as a prostitute here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm living like the world. And it was an offense to the church body and it was an offense to their society. Well, the, the society wouldn't care um, because you'd just, just be like them. But what they were saying is, I'm part of the world. And people would point at him and say, you're saying you're a Christian and you're living like this? So they were identifying there with uh, what was dishonorable. So the women were to have their head covered. And it displays insubordination or immorality. Let's read verses 5 and 6. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman, verse 6, is not covered... Let her also be shorn, and or, or it says, 
But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. And so it's displaying her rejection of authority. Women were saying, thank you, Paul, we're set free. Even if I'm a slave or I'm a woman in the Roman Empire, they, they had a low standard. And um, uh, Paul says, hey, you're free. We're all one in Christ. You're as much um, loved by God. You're in Christ just as much as your husband is, just as much as your master is. We're a body of believers. And they were like, wow, let's, let's get to this. Let's enjoy this. Okay? Let's keep, let's keep going here. So we're to guard our creation design. We're to guard our creation design. Verse 7, for if a man indeed, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God. But a woman is the glory of man. Okay, so we ought not, it says here, uh, because we're to guard God's creative design. Man was created in the image of God and was the glory of God. Genesis 1.26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God's the maker and made in the image of God. Sort of guard that. Let's keep going here. The woman was created from and for man. Let's read verses 8 and 9. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Okay, so in the creation, man, um, the woman came from the rib of Adam and was formed. Verse 9. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Okay, so the original design was that... Um, there was no helpmate found for Adam, and so God took a rib of Adam and formed Eve, the most beautiful thing that had ever, ever been made, probably, Adam would say, right? And uh, uh, made a woman uh, no less valuable than Adam, made, made uh, very special, not any less value, but, but made for Adam, it is saying here. And the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone, okay? So made him a helpmate. Uh, Titus 2, we just looked at that. Admonish young women to love their husbands, love their children, be discreet, chaste, homemakers. Okay? Um, notice also that angels exercise and observe submission. Now, this is a, a verse that uh, Bible students don't know what it means. There's different ideas, but nobody can be dogmatic on some of these things, like saying, well, this is, this is it. Well, uh, I'll tell you what I think, okay? How's that? Um, it says in verse 10, in verse 10, yes. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What do the angels have to do with it? What do the angels have to do with it? I think that, I don't know, I've thought a lot about this over the years and even with this message. What does that mean? What do, I mean, angels are around us. They are, they are um, set as, I, I ought to say it the right way. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, the last verse, um, says, Hebrews 1, but they, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall inherit salvation? So angels are sent forth to minister to those who are going to be, it says, um, who will inherit salvation. So God has his angels dealing with, with uh, those that are going to be saved, his people. And so angels around us, when they see a, a man going out with his head covered and some kind of, they're like, what? what's this guy doing? Even the seraphims there in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, with two the seraphim flew, with two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet in the worship of God as they cried, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the earth is full of his glory. And they were worshiping and praising him. And here's these, these humans down here who we are, we are made a little lower than the angels. They are a higher order of beings, as spirit beings. We're made, as in our creation, a little bit lower than them. And they look at us and say, what's the matter with these people here? They're, they're, they're running around, the men with their head covered. What are they doing? They're dishonoring Christ. Women are going around with their head uncovered in that society. They were dishonoring Christ. What are these people thinking down there? That's what I think it means. Angels are watching you, and they're learning from us about God. 
just like we watch Job and we see what happened in the book of Job. And God wants us um, to be a testimony to the angels. Angels exercise submission themselves. Angels are subject. Holy angels, evil angels fell and will be one day put in subjection and cast into the lake of fire. Humans are mutually dependent and equal. Now, don't miss this point, okay? Because, well, pastor thinks that men are better than women. I don't, because God's word doesn't say that. In the roles of leadership, men are to take that role, and women are to, to choose to take that role of submission and follow that leadership, support their leadership, pray for their husband, encourage, and even counsel. We need our wives to counsel us, men, don't we? It's good to talk to, to our wives and, and have that support and that guidance. And um, that's a real blessing of marriage, submitting to one another in the fear of God, Ephesians 5 uh, also says. Um, but uh, verse 11 says this, Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. Okay? We were born of woman. I was, was going to make a, a crackpot joke there that I was trapped in a woman's body at one time. Um, it's a bad joke. Sorry. Right? Right? And then I was born, right? Okay, off track, right? So, but that's the idea. We are, we are born, <laughs> sorry, uh, distracting you there. We are, we are born of, men were born of women, right? And uh, so, you know, we have, a, we have a mother. You're not here that you weren't born of a mother. And society's trying to blur that. They're making it all kinds of crazy. Like, you could, oh, maybe you're trapped in the wrong body. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm really a woman. Wait a minute, right? Let's just uh, take a little blood test here. We'll figure you out. If not, we can't tell any other way, right? Because it's clear the way God designed us. Okay? From, from, from uh, fertilization of that egg, it's even before conception. That was pointed out to me recently. It's not just conception when the egg was implanted in the wall of the uterus, right? It's from uh, an earlier time than that that we, God has made us who we are. Humans are mutually dependent and equal together is the idea here. So uh, don't, don't think that we think men that we're, we're so, you know, high and mighty. Uh, we're, we're all equal in Christ, and we need each other. So uh, women are naturally created to have long hair, as we think there about verse th uh, 13. What does it say here? Wow, verse 13. It says, um, judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that a woman has long hair? It is a dishonor to him. I'm sorry, let me read it again. Does not even nature teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Okay? So, so long hair. What about that? I was reading, I think it was David Jeremiah that uh, said that um, the, the whole idea of with the long hair thing is that um, women have with the estrogen, their hair naturally grows longer, and men with uh, testosterone, their hair uh, has three phases. It, it grows, but then it thins and falls out, and we, we head toward baldness. You don't often see, you know, women often keep their hair longer th than men, and that has to do with our design from God. And so even nature, uh, I believe that's what Paul's referring to here, the Word of God is referring to, that, that uh, you know, the lush curls last longer, right, or whatever it is. And uh, so um, long hair. Women naturally created to have, uh, you know, longer hair. Their hair naturally grows faster, longer, and um, stays in longer. And I liked what Harry Ironside was going to say. I was going to say it myself, but I didn't want to be misunderstood, right? Um, he says this, I think a woman, a womanly woman, is one of the sweetest and most beautiful creatures God ever made. Okay? I thought if I said that, people would be thinking, Pastor, cool it a little bit, right? No? Isn't it wonderful, though? Aren't, you know, God designed it that way. H.J. Ironside, thank you for saying that, right? And I think a womanly woman is one of the sweetest and most beautiful creatures God ever made. Now, a woman that flaunts herself, wears the tight clothes, the short clothes, showing everything, why? 
Stop it. Stop it. Save that for your special person. Save it for the marriage bed, and that marriage night is going to be woohoo, right? Sorry, did I shock you there? Amen. Do I hear any amen? A amen, Pastor. Amen. Right? That's the truth of it. Okay? And so, so long hair is a blessing from God. Women are better than men. Women are better than men at being a woman. I heard that from Adrian Rogers a couple weeks ago. I was like, yeah, you got it, man. Women are better than men at being a woman. Men are better than women at being a man. Right? We're, we're good at it. God made us that way. You know, if I tried to be a woman, oh my goodness, don't even want to think about that, right? <laughs> we're headed for trouble, right? All right? Wow. Bad stuff out there. So today, do you notice anything different about me? So think about it. I had on this morning, and I ran this by Rusty. Where's Rusty? Rusty. I ran this by Rusty, and I had this tie on earlier, and I went home, and I changed. I had this tie on. Now, culturally... This tie, you know, pastor's worn that tie before. You know, there it is. It's got the uh, eagles on. Mount up with wings like eagles, Isaiah 40, 31, right? But I got this tie on. What did you think? I got some interesting comments today. Pastor, you look uh, special today. Uh, pastor, I, I like your tie. Pastor, I thought. And uh, so I got this on today. This is kind of a way of illustrating the message. I'm just not going off, Okay. So I have this tie on today instead of this tie. Culturally, it means something to you when you saw me, didn't it? By the way, I was given this nice woo-woo. It's almost like a jacket, so good chance to wear it. Um, okay? Culturally, it, it, it's, it speaks something. And the idea, I think, with that, I'm trying to illustrate, is that the, in that day, the head covering meant something in society or the lack of a head covering meant something in society. And so that's, I think that's the important point of what's being said here. What does it mean in society? Okay? It, it, it portrays something. So today in society, um, I mean, if you went out to the store um, out of your house without a head covering on, um, women didn't cover their heads at home, but when they went out in that day, they would cover their heads so that they wouldn't work, look like the world, and they were maintaining that testimony to the glory of God, chapter 10, verse 31, and to the unbelievers that they would be a salvation, testify of the gospel, and that they would be imitators of Christ, who was subject to God, right over here, and that they would honor their husbands. And so the whole thing is, what does our society dictate to us? And we desire to... Um, in that, make a decision with our own conscience before God. These are not clear verses to interpret and apply. But as we go through this, uh, we need to be encouraged. What are you doing well? That's how Paul started out. What are you doing well? And where do you need to change? Where do you plan to change? How do you need to be consistent in what God is saying today? That's where it, what it comes down to. Will you choose to be satisfied and delight in your God-given role? Young people, if you're guys here today, or ladies here today, glory in that, rejoice in that, and, and go after that. Be, the, be a man's man, right? Is, what did I put on the... Uh, be a man or be a woman uh, here on your half sheet. Will you stop being... Here's the next thing. Will you stop being a bossy woman? You bossy to your husband? Ladies, when you get married, it's not about bossing your husband. He's to be your leader. And if you don't want to be bossed by a husband, don't get married. You can be bossy yourself all your life by yourself. Really? Amen? Do it your way. But if you get married, you're submitting to the God-ordained authority. If you're a bossy wife and you're hard on your husband, stop it. Stop being hard on your husband. He's responsible before God to lead. He's, he's to encourage you. He's to show you from Scripture. He's to, he's to help you along. That's our responsibility, husbands. But our wife is responsible to... To not be bossy and try to, try to um, 
You know, rule over their husband. No, God didn't design it that way. Now, do, they, do we need our wife's counsel? You better believe it. At least I, right? And uh, so, right? So what about you? And man, are you being an, an unloving man? Oh, I want supper on the table, and why is my fork turned the wrong way? What? Are you hard to live with, or are you kind? Could you be described as kind? And, and ladies, young ladies, young guys, now's the time to start developing that character. Don't wait till it's, you're engaged and say, well, I better start working on my attitude. It starts now with dad and mom. Developing a godly attitude. Will you plan to develop a godly attitude? Stop being a bossy, self-willed, independent, hard-headed woman. And, start, and man, stop being an unloving, kind, abusive, unthankful, bitter husband. Am I doing okay? We need to be like Christ. Imitate me, Paul says. I also imitate Christ. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense. Reach the lost. Live for him. Are you guarding the testimony of Jesus Christ in your home and in your circle of influence in the society? Are you guarding your testimony? Maybe you need to work on that. Will you reject pagan practices? Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that the Christian ought to do it today. There's some things that we don't do because the world is so wrapped up in them. Maybe there's not particularly so much wrong with some things, but you know what? Because of our testimony, we're going to distance ourselves. We're going to reject pagan practices. Are you modest in your dress? Or are you manly in your dress? Are you displaying uh, a godly character in your demeanor, not just the outside? Oh, I look so submissive. But inside, you're like a roaring lion, and you're a scorpion and a rattlesnake ready to strike. No, work on the heart too, okay? The heart's just as important. Do you want to say the heart's any less, the outward's more important than the heart? Or is the heart more important? No. Get your tongue under control. Get your heart under control. We, God help us. Amen? I'm not trying to whip you today. I'm trying to grow us. If you come to church and you don't get your feet walked on once in a while, well, we're to preach the word the Bible says. I'm trying to challenge us here. Let's raise the bar. Let's be faithful because we're always drifting back. So we're raising the standard and say, God, help us. To, to, to dress modestly, display, and have a demeanor and a deportment so as to be identified as different from worldly men and worldly women. Are you living that way? Men, are you being manly men? Women, are you being womanly women? Do you look different? Can somebody tell from behind or from the side or from the front in the checkout line or at school that you are a woman or that you are a man? They should be able to. You know, you get somebody in the checkout line and you're like, not sure, right? Wow. We ought to be easily identified. Let the hair, the hair grow. I mean, right? Men, let's, let's keep it trimmed back. Let's, you know, facial hair. God made that, right? I, I don't know. You wrestle with it with your conscience before God. Determine not to offend others. Let's finish up here. It says, um, verse 14, uh, 15, let's go 16. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. There it is. If you're going to be all upset about that, he says, Paul says, the other churches here that we've planted, church at Jerusalem, other churches aren't contentious about this thing. You need to come in line with a Christian standard. You need to come in line with these things. Okay? Choose to live it out without being contentious. Will you delight that you can add nothing to your salvation? I just want to finish up with um, 719 here. It says this. This is a verse that kind of catches my attention in interpreting the passage this way. It says, um, uh, where was it? 719. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God is what matters. It doesn't matter if you're outwardly circumcised or not. He's saying there, it's not going to help you spiritually any. And having a head covering or not is, is, is not about that. It's about our testimony in society, and it's about our relationship with God. So there you have it. Jesus paid it all. May God help us. I trust that uh, your, your heart was stirred today and challenged with the standard. Let's sing, Jesus paid it all and thank him that he paid it all.
And in our society, let's live separately. Um, in our society today, it says something that when I wear a tie like this, and if you were to wear a head covering in society, it would say something. We're in the church. And, it, you know, it's not about that so much. It's about the heart. And it's about what is our societal uh, position. And what should we look like as a man or woman with our, with our deportment, inwardly and outwardly.